Less than 48 hours after cameras began rolling, the Chinese embassy was on the phone with Disney's chief strategic officer, Lawrence Murphy. The diplomat said, You started shooting a film in Morocco about the Dalai Lama, called Kundun. It was already in production, but Murphy had never even heard of it. And despite Martin Scorsese's masterpiece having received four Academy Award nominations, you probably haven't either. Look, the most famous reference to anyone watching this film comes from The Sopranos. Barney! Kundun! I liked it! Because Disney won't let you see it. China won't let you see it. The story of Kundun lays bare the systematic silencing of one of the most significant events of the 20th century, and it reveals why entertainment is on track to be so heavily censored in the 21st. The near eradication of Kundun and Disney's capitulation to the demands of the Chinese Communist Party marked the beginning of Chinese control over the global entertainment industry that not only results in deciding which patches are allowed on Maverick's flight jacket and which squiggles are on a childish map in the Barbie movie, but which movies are allowed to be made at all? And which ones, like Scorsese's Kundun, are erased from cultural memory? The Mandarin phrase is Xia Ji Jing Ho, killing the chicken to scare the monkey. The tale of Kundun is about killing the chicken to scare the mouse. So crack open your little red book, grab a couple of shopping bags, and let's see the unseen. Between detailing Disney's and China's ambitions and how they combine to determine what you see in the theater and at home, there's a lot going on. And you have to start by understanding Kundun in the story of the 14th Dalai Lama. And yeah, there are spoilers ahead. These are kind of Saving Private Ryan spoilers, where you go into the film already knowing the basics about who the good and bad guys are and roughly how it turns out in the end. You probably already know about the Chinese invasion of Tibet and the Dalai Lama's exile. But Kundun goes deeper than you probably realize. Screenwriter Melissa Matheson met the Dalai Lama in 1990, and she began working on a screenplay about his early life. And if it seems like the screenwriter for E.T. the Extraterrestrial is a really odd fit for a religious epic, it isn't. That film was also about an unexpected journey that no one involved thought they'd ever have to take. Matheson worked directly with the Dalai Lama to develop a script based largely on his own memories. He said, okay, you know about movies, I know nothing about movies. If you think that this would be a good idea, go ahead. And he actually said a very cute thing at the end. He said, okay, sounds good for children, good for Tibet, good for publicity. And his meaning of publicity was just good to tell everybody a story that needs to be told. She wanted Martin Scorsese to direct Kundun. He'd just come from releasing Casino. How do you turn to a man who is one of the best ever at exploring raw violence? Goodfellas, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, and after Kundun, Gangs of New York and The Departed, to tell a story of Tibetan Buddhism and the Dalai Lama, the ultimate embodiment of nonviolence. The one thing that I aligned myself with were, were the people and the um, idea of the religion, the idea of compassion and kindness and tolerance and um, ultimately pacifism. It's Scorsese's obsession with people who they really are and how they really are that made him a perfect fit, because it doesn't really matter whether his subject is throwing a punch or taking one. And in terms of unraveling the complexity of religious figures, Scorsese's 1988 film The Last Temptation of Christ earned him an Academy Award nomination for Best Director. Matheson described his unique fit. And I said, you know, I'm not saying he wants to do it, but I know he's going to get it. I knew he'd understand the society, the moral code, the, the journey, and the spirituality of it. So he did. Kundun begins in 1937, four years after the death of the 13th Dalai Lama. The Tibetans are still searching for his reincarnation. The word itself, Kundun, means presence. It's an honorific for the Dalai Lama and an expression of what they hope to find. A boy in a remote farmhouse sees a necklace and declares that it's his. It belonged to the 13th Dalai Lama. And after passing a test involving the identification of a series of items that also belonged to his predecessor, they're convinced that they found their Kundun. He's whisked off to Lhasa and his brother tries to comfort him. Don't be scared. You're not the first boy to be discovered like this and certainly not to pass. A full roster of advisors and teachers helped develop him into the role he was born into, the physical manifestation of the Buddha of compassion, and both the spiritual and secular leader of Tibet. You have chosen to come back to this life once more. You will stay as long as you can, and then you will come again 
you will be born again and again as long as old life continues. You are here to love all living things. Just love them, care for them, have compassion for them. As long as any living thing draws breath, wherever he shall be, there in compassion shall the Buddha appear. And there's a lot of work to do because the very young Tenzin Gyatso was lovably bossy and bratty. But as he ages into his teens, Kundun has a very real curiosity about the world. He drives a car, which does not go well. He takes an interest in gifts from the West, like a film projector, and he familiarizes himself from afar with the news of the world, including World War II. Where's Poland, Nobu? I don't know what it is. Where's Pearl Harbor? Do you know Pompo? And he begins to understand the conflict in neighboring China. First, the war against Imperial Japan, and then the civil war between Mao's Chinese communists and the Republic of China under Chiang Kai-shek. And we get a glimpse into how hopelessly naive the Tibetans are. This is Tibet. This is China. How many soldiers do we have? About 5,000 holiness. 5,000. So many. That's a lot. Certainly, we are safe in Tibet. We hope, Kundin. Now, the film does depart from reality here to some slight degree. Tibet was extremely isolated, both geographically and culturally. Scorsese put it pretty well. The interesting thing about the uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhism was that they were up there on the top of the world, in a way, in the Himalayas, and didn't go out. They were at a natural border, borders of the, of the highest mountains in the world, and didn't go out. They couldn't go outside. So they went inside. But the Tibetan army is quite often depicted as being solely dependent on obsolete weaponry, including swords and matchlock muskets. Those weapons did exist for the Tibetans, but as China began to threaten Tibet, the Tibetan army was equipped with Lee Enfield rifles, Lewis guns, Maxim guns, Sten submachine guns. Most of those armaments would have been a better fit for World War I, and they were no match for the communist forces of the 1950s. They were hardly entirely dependent on 17th century weaponry. They also did know the terrifying power of modern militaries and 20th century arms. The 13th Dalai Lama led the country through the Sino-Tibetan War from 1930 to 1932, in which the Tibetans were actually the aggressors, having invaded Kham and Ushu with the support of the United Kingdom. They initially defeated the Sichuans, but the Ma warlords called on Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China for aid and took back the territory. And it seems that both sides committed atrocities during the conflict. History is always more complex than it seems, and we have to be honest about that. But the 13th Dalai Lama wrote a letter the year before he died, seeming to recognize the severe threat posed by a China that was becoming too large and too powerful for Tibet to withstand. It may happen that here in Tibet, religion and government will be attacked. The monasteries will be looted and destroyed, and the monks and nuns killed or chased away. We will become like slaves to our conquerors and made to wander helplessly like beggars. The days and nights will pass slowly and with great suffering and terror. But Matheson and Scorsese weren't being disingenuous by oversimplifying the situation in the film. They deliberately show the progression of how the Dalai Lama himself learned about his own nation and the world, one small, fragmented piece at a time. It's a faithful rendering of the information that trickled in to him and how he processed it. It's more of a personal picture, an intimate story, in a way. The boy had to piece it together behind the Potala walls. I mean, he couldn't go out. His whole vision of the world had to happen within his own room. And finally, it all had to happen within his own mind. The burden with which Tenzin Gyatso was charged is one of the most unique in human history. There have been child leaders thrust into responsibility well beyond their years, but no one has ever carried the spiritual weight of a nation along with that country's administration in the wake of mankind's most terrible war from the perspective of a nation centuries behind economically and culturally as technology, communication, and every facet of life raced forward around them. Scorsese captured that maelstrom perfectly. You will soon have great responsibilities. You must know what to do. But to a single B-29 over the Japanese city of Hiroshima, it was the beginning of a new era for civilization. 8.15 in the morning found a 400-pound bomb with a destructive force of 20,000 tons of TNT mushrooming up over the stunned enemy city. To the frightened inhabitants, the end of the world had come. The Dalai Lama was only in his teens, and it was already a completely different world than he was born into. 
The communists rolled in and the Dalai Lama pleaded to the international community for help. Asking for military intervention in the post-World War II era was seriously unfortunate timing, and none came. This week began the peaceful liberation of Tibet. Members of the People's Liberation Army have entered this western region of China at the urging of the Tibetan minority. Long a stronghold of imperialists, the Tibetan people have found themselves living in a feudal kingdom under the tyranny of the Dalai Lama. As the People's Army moves toward the capital of Lhasa, the local peasants gratefully welcome their liberators and happily join the crusade. Well, that was a lie. The communists delivered the 17-point agreement, with point number one decreeing that the Tibetan people shall return to the big family of the motherland. The other points were a blend of promising autonomy to Tibet while outlining its total takeover by China. The Dalai Lama eventually ratified it, although he repudiated the agreement eight years later, claiming that he only agreed under duress. A litany of Chinese military and administrative officials explained to the Tibetans the hopelessness of China under imperialism and described what Mao saved them from. There was a day before the war when I came up on a man with a dead baby. He was going to cook it. He shouted. It died. I did not kill it. It died. That is what it was like in China before Chairman Mao. China was as grim a part of the world as we had at that time. Those stories were not exaggerations. It was obvious by this point that Tibet, alone in the world and overmatched, had no alternative but to negotiate for the best possible relations with China. And the Dalai Lama was hopeful that a generous and caring Mao could improve the Tibetans' lot. Tenzin's brother explains that at first the Chinese were kind and helpful, then prodding and insulting, burning homes and banning singing in public meetings. Mao described the situation very differently. The news of the People's Liberation Army's march into Tibet was enthusiastically supported by all sections of the population. In particular, Tibetans in all parts of China jubilantly celebrated the news and demanded their return to the motherland. The mission of China is to bring progress to Tibet. We welcome you, Tibet, back to the motherland. One of the most poignant and Scorsesean moments of Kundun is the photography scene that shows the Dalai Lama meeting Mao after his speech. Here's what it meant to Scorsese. The flashbulbs are like exclamation points. In a funny way, it's really meant to create a kind of disturbing undercurrent of what's to come. Those flashbulbs are like gunshots. They're like aggressive attacks, insinuations of what's going to happen. Mao assures the Dalai Lama that the pace of reform must meet with the desires of the Tibetan people and that changes must be made slowly as he judges them necessary. It's a full-on charm offensive with Mao fawning over Tibet's long, rich history. He says Tibet has fallen behind, which is true, and that China wants to help. It's really pretty good stuff, and it sounds wonderful for Tibet. And Mao even says that his own mother was a Buddhist. He leaves out that he was, too, until he repudiated Buddhism as a teen. But he explains how much respect he has for the Buddha, who he points out was anti-caste, anti-corruption, and anti-exploitation. The Dalai Lama is convinced. I think socialism and Buddhism have some things in common. He has made important promises. He described the meeting decades later. Tell me more. I think treated me uh, like his own child. And looks, uh, appears, as he really, I'll say, liked me. <laughs> Just minutes before the Dalai Lama is set to leave, they meet one last time. And after His Holiness happily tells Mao that he agrees with some of his ideas for reform, Mao cuts him off. And the benevolent father Mao reveals himself to be a very different Chairman Mao. Your attitude is good, you know. I understand you well, but you need to learn this. Religion is poison. Like a poison, it weakens the race. Like a drug, it retards the mind of people and society, the opiate of the people. Tibet has been poisoned by religion, and your people are poisoned and inferior. That's it. It is over for Tibet and the Dalai Lama knows it. His Holiness asks a woman whether she's happy, and her tearful response kind of says it all. I'm very happy and prosperous under the Chinese Communist Party and Chairman Bolton. But it gets so much worse. 
The Chinese have bombed the monastery of Litang. It has been destroyed. They throw rocks from aeroplanes. Nuns and monks are made to fornicate in the streets. They put their guns in the hands of our Kampa children and force the child to kill the parents. When the Chinese military sends a letter suggesting that the Dalai Lama and his entourage occupy a specific building, because if he does, they say that they will try to avoid bombing that one, it is time to leave. The Dalai Lama has not returned to Tibet since 1959. Kundun is an absolute masterpiece, and Scorsese himself can explain what makes Kundun so powerful and unique. To recreate this culture, you recreate the culture as best you can in detail, in color, shape, form, sets, costumes, faces. You recreate the culture, and if you add to that a Philip Glass's music, a Thelma's editing, all of us pulling this together, and it sort of takes you and immerses you in the culture. And being immersed in that culture, you care about the people. That was the idea. You care about the people, you care about Tibet, you know? And then the politics, in a sense, is last, because I think you had to go with the people first. The politics comes out of the people. Uh, I didn't want to make a picture that was a propaganda film, number one. Uh, in fact, I try to give the Chinese moments where they presented their points of view. In a way, maybe simplistic in a way, but just to show that they believed in what they were doing. Roger Deakins' cinematography is stunning. Philip Glass's score shuffles the picture through every second. Both men were nominated for Oscars for their work on Kundun. But the casting is especially unique. None of the Tibetan roles were played by professionals. There were no actors or actresses. Tibetans were tapped for each role to give the story realism and gravitas, and many of the key roles were played by the Dalai Lama's own family members. His mother in the film is actually his niece in real life. So why did a fantastic film in style and substance with a $28 million budget from one of the world's great entertainment empires only manage $5.7 million at the box office? Why can't you stream Kundun right now on Amazon Prime Video? Why is it on Netflix or Hulu or available for purchase on YouTube? Why is Christopher Moltisanti the only person who's ever actually seen Kundun? And if Disney made the film, why isn't it available on Disney Plus? Back to that phone call with Lawrence Murphy. By making Kundun, Disney had committed a T violation. Now, anyone who deals with China is subject to what's known as the three T's. Tiananmen, Taiwan, and Tibet. And companies, universities, and individuals who touch upon any of those three T's face swift retribution and usually a lifelong ban from dealing with China. In 1996, the China that we know today, the one that exercises its power and control over entertainment, not only within its own borders, but globally, had begun to emerge. Just a few decades before, China was really in no position to do any of that. There's a reason why China was used to shame Randy. Randy, will you eat? There are starving people in China. By the time Kundun went into production, China was well beyond the tens of millions of deaths from the Great Leap Forward, the Great Famine, and the Cultural Revolution. And while things continued to be terrible in China, and in many, many ways still are, despite the nation's drastic reduction of severe poverty in our lifetimes, by the 1990s, Deng Xiaoping's market reforms had begun to pay off. China was getting wealthier in every respect, as were the 1.4 billion Chinese within its borders. And if foreign companies wanted access to that market, they were going to play by China's rules. Kundun marked the first opportunity for China to flex that muscle in the movie business. Disney knew they were getting into a sticky situation with Kundun right from the beginning. Melissa Matheson explains. This is not the kind of movie that studios are falling all over themselves wanting to make. It was still a struggle, but we had Marty. Imagine the situation if Scorsese hadn't been attached. What Matheson didn't say in that interview is that Universal Studios had not only passed on Kundun, but roundly rejected the prospect of it. Universal had been acquired by the beverage giant Seagram, and the CEO, Edgar Bronfman Jr., said, I'm not doing this. I don't need to have my spirits and wine business thrown out of China. It simply wasn't the 1950s anymore, where you could cast John Wayne to play Genghis Khan. Everybody knew that if you were going to go up against China, you would need to have a very, very good reason. But if you're Disney, maybe you could salvage this and untangle such a sensitive, intricate situation and negotiate your way through it. And if it's the mid-1990s and you needed an international relations superstar on your side, who do you get? 
Disney already had someone on the payroll to help the company sort out its dealings with the CCP. The most infamous diplomat of the second half of the 20th century and the man who opened relations with China under Nixon, Henry Kissinger. Here's what Kissinger and Disney were up against. A member of China's film bureau said, We are resolutely opposed to the making of this movie. It is intended to glorify the Dalai Lama, so it is an interference in China's internal affairs. Think about what this means. If you're 6,000 miles from Beijing and you want to make a piece of art about a historical event that happened 40 years prior, with the explicit permission and active involvement of the main subject, you are considered by the CCP to be meddling in China's internal affairs. Michael Eisner was Disney's CEO, and he didn't have any palatable options here. If he killed the film, then Disney was the one engaging in the censorship of one of the most respected filmmakers in the world. They'd be seen, rightly, as capitulating to China. And if they went full speed ahead, well, they'd just plain lose access to the most promising emerging market in the world. Sony was in the middle of its own Tibetan mess with the release of Seven Years in Tibet, the Brad Pitt film about Heinrich Harrer's unlikely relationship with the Dalai Lama, which was also made with his cooperation. And MGM was about to release Red Corner with Richard Gere, in which an American businessman is on trial for murder in China, with three high-profile studios releasing unflattering material right when China was trying to kick off its moment. You can see why they decided to take a stand. Michael Eisner and Kissinger decided on a least bad approach, and that was sending Kundun quietly to the Gulag. Instead of pulling the plug, and instead of standing up to the CCP, they decided to give it a very limited release. But before they could give it a softer version of the old Yeller treatment, China had already kicked them out. A public memo said, In order to protect Chinese national overall interests, it has been decided that all business cooperation with these three companies, Disney, MGM United Artists, and Columbia TriStar, to be ceased temporarily without exception. An embassy spokesman said, These films are full of inaccuracies. That's why they are not popular within China. They are so biased against China, that's why Chinese audiences will not welcome these films. Oh, so it, it's the Chinese people who have decided that the films they haven't ever seen are full of inaccuracies. Well, the Eisner-Kissinger plan did not work. So Disney tried to make the best of it. To ensure Kundun encountered the fewest possible eyeballs, they scheduled for a Christmas Day release. Because you want to treat yourself to a harrowing Tibetan tragedy right after you watch your kid rip open his Tickle Me Elmo. The Kevin Costner film based on David Brin's novel The Postman opened the same day on 2,207 screens. Kundun was shown on two screens. It eventually kicked around a few hundred more, never for long, and tallied that $5.7 million overall take. That's barely a rounding error in Disney's $23 billion annual revenue at that time. And then Disney's Kundun saga was over. Sort of. In 1998, Michael Eisner flew to meet with the premier of China. In the book Red Carpet, Hollywood, China, and the Global Battle for Cultural Supremacy, Eric Schwartzel relays what Eisner said, an apology that forever altered the global entertainment landscape. We made a stupid mistake in releasing Kundun. This film was a form of insult to our friends. The bad news is that the film was made. The good news is that nobody watched it. Here I want to apologize, and in the future we should prevent this sort of thing, which insults our friends, from happening. In short, we're, we're a family entertainment company, a company that uses silly ways to amuse people. That's the moment. That's the moment when we knew that China had successfully killed the chicken to scare the monkeys. It was, as Schwartzel writes, the continuation of an edict that Mao had laid bare 50 years prior. We must adhere firmly to principle and severely criticize and repudiate all works of literature and art expressing views in opposition to the nation, to science, to the masses, and to the Communist Party. Schwartzel chose to trim both ends of that quote, which was explicitly addressing Japanese art. But the point still stands. The Chinese Communist Party of the 1990s, just years after Tiananmen, was ready to deliver on Mao's broader vision. The premier responded to Eisner by saying, I very much admire your courage in correcting mistakes and the efforts you've made to promote Sino-American friendship. This also proves that you're a very far-sighted businessman. 
and is also an important factor in ensuring the success of the Disney company. Banksy has engaged in more subtle writing on the wall than that response. And while the message was to Eisner, it was really to the entire Western entertainment industry. Why would Eisner and Disney do this? Disney had long-term plans for a resort on mainland China, and that worked. Shanghai Disneyland opened in 2016. They wanted continued and growing access to the cheap manufacture of all of their goods. A 2018 CNBC report highlighting nightmare conditions said that, in the Watong factory, an employee producing Disney's Princess Sing and Sparkle Ariel doll would have a daily quota of up to 2,500 toys per day. They would work 26 days a month, earning 435 US dollars per month, plus one cent for each doll produced. The Ariel doll currently retails on Amazon for $34.97 in the United States. Mulan had been released months before Eisner went to China, and Disney wanted it to be the first of many appealing movies to the Chinese market. But to get wallets out in stores, bodies into theater seats, and foot traffic into resorts, first I had to build a Disney-loving culture, since the Disney-adoring child to Disney-adoring parent pipeline just didn't exist in China. They eventually opened 26 Disney English locations, which offered full English language immersion in themed rooms for Toy Story, Snow White, The Lion King, Cars, and more. By 2011, other studios were getting in the game as well. DreamWorks delivered a hero tailored perfectly to China's children. Poe the Kung Fu Panda. Kundun, Seven Years, and Red Corner were all invited to what would be China's version of the film industry's Red Wedding. And decades later, the cycle of censorship and capitulation at the direction of the CCP, not to mention the shocking scale of self-censorship done to eliminate even the suggestion of friction with China, goes well beyond the big and small screens. On January 12, 2018, the Cyberspace Administration of China ordered Marriott International to take down its website for one week because their social media manager liked a tweet thanking Marriott for listing Tibet as a country on a customer questionnaire. And that employee was fired. On November 6, 2019, Shutterstock was found to have banned six terms and their variants on mainland China. President Xi, Chairman Mao, Taiwan flag, dictator, yellow umbrella, and Chinese flag. 180 employees protested the censorship, and they were told that anyone who opposed was free to resign. On June 12, 2020, Zoom banned the accounts of US-based users who were using the platform to talk about the Tiananmen Square massacre and the Hong Kong protests, all at the CCP's request. On June 4, 2021, Bing censored search results for tank man imagery and video, despite it being the 32nd anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Thanks to Disney and Michael Eisner, we now have a China problem that extends well beyond the artistic sphere. But back to Kundun, Martin Scorsese, ever the diplomat, unless the subject is Marvel movies, really wanted to avoid distracting from what he said was... One of the greatest, it was probably the best experience of shooting a movie I've ever had. Before the start of that interview, he's actually asked about his upcoming plans, and look at his eyes as he responds. So... Uh... I, I think what you're doing is you're, you're going to go to Europe soon and promote this thing? I have to, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I believe on March 1st or so. He is on his own, and he knows it. Then something happened with Kundun also, where they uh, were supposed to screen a Berlin Film Festival, but then we got a request before being listed as one of the films in the festival. They wanted to screen the entire picture. And I said, no. Some, it must have been some misunderstanding, because then they've apologized since then, but, but there was some sort of misunderstanding, I think. He knows exactly what happened there. There was actually a plan to produce a documentary that would serve as a companion to Kundu, one that showed the process of conceiving and making the film, talking to all the principals involved, including the Dalai Lama. The idea was that it would pair perfectly with the film itself, both setting its historical and modern contexts and expanding on the artistic endeavor. Michael Henry Wilson had previously co-directed A Personal Journey with Martin Scorsese through American movies, and he was also behind In Search of Kundun, the fantastic 84-minute documentary which, due to Disney's treatment of the release, never quite got that pairing it deserved. And Wilson is the only one who at the time was open about the Chinese pressure on the film and how that affected distribution and legacy. 
Now, what happened is that while Marty was making Kundun, the, the, the Chinese discovered the, 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 the project and um, exerted pressures on, uh, on the studio, Disney, to uh, either stop or limit the, you know, the, the distribution of the film. And in other words, Kundun became a political football and it became entangled in a very complex political situation which meant that uh, clearly that the, the, the documentary would have to stand on its own and have its own life and could not be released as a companion piece because the documentary would be dealing with questions that were probably even more problematic to the, to the Chinese since we're dealing with what happened after they had invaded the, uh, the country. It's after the rights of Lhasa, which saw the, the departure of the Dalai Lama, that then they really clamped down on, on, on the Tibetan culture, started destroying the monasteries, bombing them, and uh, tried to eradicate the, 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 the culture. So if you're doing a documentary about the Dalai Lama, there's no way you can avoid that aspect. Also, the studio sold non-American rights to various companies. There was no global plan for the release of Kundun as there would be on a film that is handled by one studio worldwide, where it's planned country by country, you know. But this was not the case with, uh, with Kundun, where each country had a different uh, distributor. By the time the documentary was released in New York and in Los Angeles, Marty's film Kundun was out of distribution. Uh, the run was was over. The studio was not interested in re-releasing it. So it ended up that it's on television that the two films ran together. The first television showings of a documentary were in conjunction with Marty's film on uh, Stars Television. So uh, uh, in television, we were totally synchronistic, but not in the theaters. Stars, which at the time was a fledgling fringe service only available to a few million households, and which was losing hundreds of millions each year, was the only outlet with the courage to back Kundun, presumably because they had nothing to lose and no immediate plans for China. But at least we have that companion piece, which is teeming with gems of understanding, including the Dalai Lama's continued optimism. Whether we like it or not, China, Tibet, we have to live side by side with compassionate motivation, with respect to others' right, while we are trying to gain our own right. This bring long future friendly and a harmonious neighbor or a companion. His Holiness's commitment to nonviolence and peace is such that he doesn't admit there's a grim alternative to living side by side. And that's when one nation buries another and lives on top of its grave. And you, where do you see Kundun now? Like we said, it's streaming nowhere online. Your only option is to purchase a physical disc from Kino Lorber, a distributor that specializes in art house, foreign, and largely forgotten films. If you're in the market for a copy of the 1922 German silent film Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror, Kino Lorber has you covered. And when you get your Kundun disc, look at the back of the keep case. You'll see all the names you'd expect, Scorsese, Matheson, Glass, Deacons, and Touchstone Pictures. And since the distribution rights were spread across multiple entities worldwide, you won't see the name Disney. This sweeping epic that documents one of the most severe violations of autonomy and human rights of our time, resulting in a culture somewhere between diaspora, displacement, and erasure, and the deaths of over one million people, doesn't even have that T-word on the front cover, where Kundun is described simply as the amazing story of the 14th Dalai Lama. The back cover buries the name just once in the middle of the description. In a 1957 speech at the Chinese Communist Party's National Conference on Propaganda Work, Mao said, the Communist Party does not fear criticism because we are Marxists. The truth is on our side, and the basic masses, the workers and peasants, are on our side. In his 1941 Serve the People, Mao said, If we have shortcomings, we are not afraid to have them pointed out and criticized because we serve the people. Anyone, no matter who, may point out our shortcomings. If he is right, we will correct them. If what he proposes will benefit the people, we will act upon it. Both quotes appear in Mao's Little Red Book, but none of that has ever been true in the People's Republic of China. Not in the occupied Tibet of the 1950s or after Tiananmen in 1989, and not in the Taiwan of 2023. In the 25 years since Disney's apology for making Kundun, China's censorship over what you can say and what you can see has become so commonplace that it's just an accepted part of doing business in the global community. 
And despite a bipartisan inclusion in the latest defense bill that restricts spending on films that cater to Chinese political pressure, how much will that matter? You can't turn back the clock and force Disney and Sony and every other international conglomerate to stand up to China's Communist Party and forego tens of billions in the process. But when the CCP insists that it has control over the Hua He Jin, or the right to speak, and when the CCP mandates that the world respect its edict to Zhongguo Gu Chu, or tell China's story well, you can recognize when people like Matheson and Scorsese have done exactly that. Because sometimes the most revolutionary thing you can do is simply watch a movie that they don't want you to see.